Human beings have lived in almost every kind of society, from uh, the most egalitarian um, hunting and gathering societies seem to have been very egalitarian, for instance based on food sharing, gift exchange. Small bands of people living predominantly off of foraging, um, but a little bit of hunting, predominantly among people you have at the least known your entire life, if not surrounded by third cousins or closer, in a world in which there is a great deal of fluidity between different groups, in a world in which there is not a whole lot in terms of material culture, this is how humans have spent most of their hominid history. And no surprise that makes for a very different world. One of the things you get as a result of that is far less violence. Organized group violence is not something that occurred at that time of human history, and that seems quite clear. So where did we go wrong? Violence is not uh, universal. It's not symmetrically distributed throughout the human race. There is a huge variation in the amount of violence in different societies. There are some societies that have virtually no violence. There are others that uh, destroy themselves. Some of the um, Anabaptist religious groups that are complete strict pacifists, like the Amish, the Mennonites, the Hutterites. Among some of these groups, the Hutterites, uh, there are no recorded cases of homicide. Uh, uh, during uh, uh, our major wars, like World War II, where people were being drafted, they would refuse to serve in the military. They would go to prison rather than serve in the military. In the kibbutzim in Israel, the level of violence is so low that the criminal courts there will often send violent offenders, people who've committed crimes, to live on the kibbutzim in order to learn how to live a nonviolent life, because that's the way people live there. So we are amply shaped by society. Our societies in the broader sense, including our theological, our metaphysical, our linguistic influences, etc., our societies help shape us as to whether or not we think life is basically about sin or about beauty, whether the afterlife will carry a price for how we live our lives or if it's irrelevant. In a broad sort of way, different large societies could be termed as individualistic or collectivist, and you get very different people and different mindsets, and I suspect different brains coming along with that. We in America are in one of the most individualistic of societies, and capitalism being a system that allows you to go higher and higher up a, a potential pyramid, and the deal is it comes with fewer and fewer safety nets. By definition, the more stratified a society is, the fewer people you have as peers, the fewer people with whom you have symmetrical, reciprocal relationships, and instead all you have are differing spots and endless hierarchies, and a world in which you have few reciprocal partners is a world with a lot less altruism. All right, so this brings us to a total impossible juncture, which is to try to make sense in a perspective of science as to what the nature is of human nature. You know, on a certain level, the nature of our nature is not to be con particularly constrained by our nature. Um, we come up with more social variability than any species out there. More systems of belief, of styles, of family structures, of ways of raising children. The capacity for variety that we have is extraordinary. In a society which is predicated on competition and uh, really very often the ruthless exploitation of one human being by another, the profiteering of other people's problems, and very often the creation of problems for the purpose of profiteering. The ruling ideology will very often justify that behavior by appeals to some fundamental and unalterable human nature. So the myth in our society is that people are competitive by nature, and that they're individualistic, and that they're selfish. The real uh, reality is quite the opposite. We have certain human needs. The only way that you can talk about human nature concretely is by recognizing that there's certain human needs. We have a human need for companionship and for close contact, to be loved, to be attached to, to be accepted, to be seen, to be received for who we are. If those needs are met, we, we develop into people who are compassionate 
and cooperative and, um, and who have empathy for other people. So the opposite that we often see in our society is in fact the distortion of human nature precisely because so few people have their needs met. So yes, you can talk about human nature, but only in a sense of basic human needs that are instinctively evoked, or I should say certain human needs that lead to certain traits if they are met and a different set of traits if they're denied. So, when we recognize the fact that the human organism, which has a great deal of adaptive flexibility allowing us to survive in many different conditions, is also rigidly programmed for certain environmental requirements or human needs, a social imperative begins to emerge. Just as our bodies require physical nutrients, the human brain demands positive forms of environmental stimulus at all stages of development, while also needing to be protected from other negative forms of stimulus. And if things that should happen do not, or if things that shouldn't happen do, it is now apparent that the door can be opened for not only a cascade of mental and physical diseases, but many detrimental human behaviors as well. So as we turn our perspective now outward and take account for the state of affairs today, we must ask the question, is the condition we have created in the modern world actually supporting our health? Is the bedrock of our socio-economic system acting as a positive force for human and social development and progress? Or is the foundational gravitation of our society actually going against the core evolutionary requirements needed to create and maintain our personal and social well-being.